Now on the History Channel, stories from the pages of time, stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement, as we go in search of history. Werewolves. Today's images of these man-turned-wolf monsters mostly came from the make-believe world of Hollywood. But the ancient Greeks and Romans believed werewolves actually existed and were absolutely deadly. Shockingly, in the 16th century, 30,000 people in France were accused of being werewolves. As we go in search of history, we'll discover the beliefs, fears, and hysteria that surround legends of the werewolves. People have always had a macabre fascination with what terrifies them most. Whether it's real-life savagery of serial killers like Jeffrey Dahmer, or imagined monsters like Frankenstein and Dracula, humans are irresistibly drawn to these horrifying subjects. One of the most ancient and enduring is the werewolf. There were werewolf stories as far back as you find recorded stories. And in all countries, uh, in Greece, in Middle Europe, in Asia, they're everywhere. At the dawn of civilization, there was little that separated man from beast. People then thought humans could revert to animals, a belief called shape-shifting. Virtually every society, primitive societies and so forth, have stories and beliefs about transformation from animal to human form and, and, and vice versa. You go back, even on the cave paintings, you have pictures of what appear to be half man, half stag. And all civilization has probably been a story of, you know, keeping uh, certain impulses and emotions and, and, uh, and urges uh, in, in check. And most of these are the, uh, um, the more primitive instincts, the animal instincts. So ever since man started becoming civilized, you know, the werewolf has been lurking somewhere back there in, in, in the shadow. Not so much in the shadows that the werewolf wasn't noted by the ancient Greek and father of history, Herodotus. In the fifth century BC, he reported in his travels of a shape-shifting people known as Nurians. Each Nurian changes himself once a year into the form of a wolf, and he continues in that form for several days, after which he resumes his former shape you'll find very strong werewolf myths in, in, among the Greeks, among the Romans. I mean, you got Roman werewolf stories which sound like they were, you know, they, they were produced by Hollywood last week. One of these stories came from a Roman satirist named Petronius. He was among the first to chronicle an enduring connection between werewolves and a full moon. Petronius wrote of a man who, on a night lit by a full moon, went to visit his mistress. He asked a soldier friend to accompany him. Along the way, the soldier suddenly stopped, stripped off his clothes, transformed into a wolf, and ran into the darkness. The full moon really does have a connection with genuine werewolf lore, because there is a belief is that somehow the full moon creates madness in people, lunacy, moon. So the full moon and the transformation from man to beast is a natural, magical connection. Arriving at his mistress's home, the man learned that a servant had fought off a wolf with a sword, wounding it in the neck. The next day, the man discovered the soldier in his barracks, dying of a sword wound to his neck. These were stories that were widely told and widely believed. Um, that if you, if you were wounded as a, as a wolf, you transformed back into human form, but the wound stayed with you. 
An even more horrifying account of a werewolf came from the Roman poet Ovid. Writing in the first century, he told of an ancient Greek king named Lycaon, whose cruelty was so notorious that the king of the gods, Jupiter himself, paid him a visit. But Lycaon refused to believe his visitor was a god and tested him by serving a sumptuous feast in which he had secretly mixed human flesh. Cannibalism, even, even among the ancient Greeks, was, was a no-no. I mean, that's a, that was a real taboo. To put a cannibal meal before a god was a tremendous offense. Jupiter instantly detected the tainted food. Furious, he turned Lycaon into a wolf so he could pursue his penchant for human flesh in a more suitable form. From the name of King Lycaon comes the word lycanthrope, meaning one who transforms into a wolf. This story has, has had a profound effect upon uh, our understanding of werewolves because here right at the very beginning was a recognition that uh, the whole idea of werewolfism was related to uh, those aspects of the human being that were opposed to civilization and civilized society. During the Middle Ages, the belief that humans transform into animal predators was prevalent around the world and was by no means limited to wolves. In Lapland, there were were-reindeer. In South America, were-opossums. And in Japan, were-wildcats. What we're talking about is a phenomena where people believe they or some of their neighbors can change into an animal. That animal is the predominant predator of the area. People then believed that donning the skin or pelt of an animal was one way to become that animal. Vikings made this belief a part of their military arsenal by getting into bear skins before battle. This practice contributed to their reputation for being absolutely fearless and maniacal warriors. They were called barsark, a term that survives today as the word berserk. The word, what the word really means in the ancient language is the men in bear shirts. What the berserkers would do is they put on these bearskin shirts and uh, feel that they had been in some way uh, magically imbued with the courage, the strength, the ferocity of a bear. They were very much feared and they were known be completely out of, you know, they were out of control. They were no longer human. Throughout medieval Europe, however, it was the wolf that was most feared. As the largest carnivore in the area, it was thought to be the most dangerous predator people might encounter. Montague Summers, a 19th century authority on occultism and the supernatural, aptly described what the wolf meant to medieval Europeans. The distinctive features of the wolf are unbridled cruelty, bestial ferocity, and ravening hunger. He has something of the demon of hell. He's the symbol of night and winter, of stress and storm, the dark and mysterious harbinger of death. Cautionary stories about wolves were widely repeated, especially to the most vulnerable part of the population, children. One of the most famous of these is Little Red Riding Hood. Oh, Grandma, what big teeth you have. The better to eat you with, my dear. But it is a very, very sinister story, and it's clearly a werewolf story, because here you've got the little girl, and here you've got the wolf dressed up like grandmother. You have the wolf talking to Little Red Riding Hood. This is no ordinary wolf. Clearly, this is a werewolf. As we go in search of history, werewolf hysteria sweeps through Europe. In the 16th and 17th centuries, Europe was a hotbed of werewolf activity. It was a tumultuous time. 
racked with irrational fears, superstition, and sweeping religious change. During the height of the Middle Ages, particularly as the Reformation was, was about to begin, the, the great struggle against witchcraft, the burning times, uh, began to occur. And right on the heels of the struggle against witchcraft, a new struggle with werewolfism began. And all of a sudden there was this new wave of belief that werewolves and witches all existed and that they were all having a supernatural and negative impact upon society. The panic surrounding werewolves grew from witchcraft hysteria. From 1300 to 1700, thousands of people were brought to trial on charges of witchcraft. The accusations, human sacrifice, cannibalism, and sexual license, came primarily from peasants. And the accused were almost exclusively peasants as well. Witchcraft hysteria was fueled partly by economic and societal problems. Poverty, disease, crime, and famine commonly plagued Europe. Peasants, no matter how hard they worked, ended up with less. With almost no way to climb out of the bottom, many peasants blamed their poverty and other troubles on the witchery of their neighbors. So other peasants became scapegoats for incurable social ills. People really are on the brink. Uh, that's when misfortune hits them. And it's all part of society purging itself violently and horrifically when it's under extreme emotional and physical pressure. Which fears were also fueled by religion. Then the Catholic Church was the dominant force in people's lives. It dictated behavior and provided explanations for phenomena people didn't understand. According to church doctrine, Satan intended to destroy Christian civilization and required hordes of disciples, witches, to do so. Sorcery was viewed as treason, an attempt to overthrow the church. It's the time when Christendom splits in half as never before, when Protestantism appears, and suddenly it looks as if Lucifer's legions are pouring out. This is an all-out struggle. To thwart sorcery, the church created the Inquisition, an extreme legal process that made massive witch hunting possible. Bishops serving as inquisitors sought out heretics, those who spoke or wrote against the traditions of the Roman church. By 1231, Inquisition courts under direct control of the papacy were established across Europe. Heretics who repented received a sentence of life imprisonment. Those who wouldn't repent were usually burned alive. The Inquisition ruthlessly pursued a bloody course. Its goal was to annihilate all people who were not sincere Roman Catholic Christians. Among the victims, Protestants, Jews, witches, mystics, and werewolves. Werewolfism, or lycanthropy, was considered a form of witchcraft. Both involved a pact with the devil, heresy. People are all around were afraid that strange, magical things were happening to other people and against them. Once a hysteria begins, it tends to spread. So that when a really gruesome crime was met up with, werewolves were immediately suspected. By the 16th century, the secular courts had adopted inquisition procedures to protect society from witches and werewolves. In 1532, Judicial torture became the legal means to determine malevolent witchcraft and lycanthropy. You can't actually prove the crime materially. You can't prove that somebody cast a spell at a particular moment. So the only sure way of obtaining a verdict is a confession. And once you've got that idea into your head, uh, the best way of obtaining a confession is to apply force. 
Inquisitors hearing these confessions and finding it hard to contemplate the inhuman and sadistic horrors of the crimes enumerated, preferred to think of them as having been committed by a true monster, half man, half wolf, in league with the devil. In France, the term for werewolf was loup garou, and suddenly in the early 1500s, werewolves began to appear there in epidemic proportions. According to legend, they could be easily identified. You've got eyebrows that meet together. Good sign of a werewolf. Werewolves have hair growing on their palms. Of course, they shave, but they have very rough palms then. So that's the rough palms are a sign of a werewolf. Anybody in 16th century France who lived off alone, isolated from other people, who was unkempt, who behaved in a wild, strange, or disagreeable manner might easily be thought of as a werewolf. In a slew of accusations and arrests between 1520 and 1630, more than 30,000 people in France alone were brought to trial, accused of being werewolves. Typical was the story of a 16th century peasant named Gilles Garnier. He had the telltale eyebrows that met in the middle and lived like a hermit in a hut outside the city of Dole. Villagers rescuing a girl from an attacking wolf thought they recognized Gilles in the animal. They believed he had transformed himself by rubbing a magic salve on his skin. One week later, Gilles was seized, barbarously tortured into a confession, and burned at the stake. But the victims of werewolf hunts were by no means limited to men. One famous account of a she-wolf came from central France. In the Auvergne region, a hunter was attacked by a wolf in 1558. In the fierce battle, the hunter managed to slice off a paw. Putting the severed limb in his pouch, he stopped by a nobleman's chateau to relate his adventure. But when he pulled out the paw, he found the slender hand of a woman with a gold wedding band on one finger. Recognizing the ring, the nobleman raced upstairs and found his wife bandaging the bloody stump of her arm. She confessed to being a werewolf and was burned at the stake. Confessions, however, were of doubtful authenticity because of the interrogation process. Then they, they sort of, you know, boil people in oil and, and put a, you know, torture them with hot pincers. And you boy, you'd be surprised how quickly somebody's gonna confess to being a werewolf or a witch under those circumstances. Such was the fate in 1589 of a poor peasant named Peter Stump. He was accused of becoming a werewolf by donning a magic pelt. Never mind that no pelt was ever found. Authorities had a confession elicited with the aid of red-hot pincers, the wheel, and by pulling flesh from his bones, all of which was depicted in a sensational publication of the times known as a broadside. Stump's fate became the best known of all werewolves because the broadside was devoured by people seeking escape from the relentless grind of daily life. It's a bestseller in 16th century Europe. I mean, people love that sort of stuff. They still do today. But, but this, was, this was supposed to be real. I mean, this, 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 these broadsides were the national inquirers of their, of their day. One werewolf trial in 1604 made legal history with an unprecedented incident of compassion. The defendant was Jean Grenier, a 14-year-old shepherd from the Bordeaux region of France. He was a slow-witted boy. Today, he would be termed mentally disabled, given to roaming the countryside. When a witness testified that she had seen him put on a magic pelt and turn into a wolf, he was arrested. He claimed that a mysterious dark stranger, the devil perhaps, had given him the pelt which turned him into a werewolf. He freely admitted to stalking the forest, coming upon children and attacking them. The courtroom erupted in uncomfortable laughter when Grenier described his preference for young flesh, 
finding an old woman as tough as leather. This made him a sure candidate for execution. However, a lawyer made an impassioned speech that he was a victim of his disordered brain. The argument of insanity prevailed, and instead of death, Grenier was sentenced to prison in a monastery where he steadily deteriorated and died before the age of 20. That was sort of remarkable that somebody would look at a case like this and say, wait a minute, this is not a werewolf. This, this person does not turn into a wolf. When In Search of History returns, some explanations for what happened. As early as the second century AD, Roman doctors astonishingly recognized werewolfism as a psychological disease, a form of depression. But the treatment seemed as bad as a werewolf attack, the opening of a vein, and letting of blood. While the cure was barbaric, the diagnosis was quite perceptive. Today, psychiatrists have a name for the mental illness in which a person believes he or she actually changes into a wolf, lycanthropy. Such a person may even howl, crave raw meat, or run around on all fours during an attack of this sickness. There are now enough cases that uh, we can begin to look at them and uh, see that there are, are people who have this uh, grand delusions that they can change and do change into uh, different animals and that when they get into the, uh, that delusion they even act out the part and do things that we think of as being associated with the uh, animals. By the mid-17th century, people had begun to realize that those who proclaimed themselves to be wolves were instead insane. Many victims were sent off to monasteries rather than being burned at the stake. A few imagined werewolves were not insane, though. They might have been under the influence of drugs. Ointments were often concocted by so-called witches to treat the illnesses of peasant folk. Into a cauldron went plants and herbs such as poppy seeds from opium, aconite or wolfbane, which slows down the heart, and belladonna, a poisonous plant also known as deadly nightshade. When rubbed into the skin, this magic salve entered the bloodstream and induced mental confusion, wild excitement, and delirium. Thinking one had become a werewolf would not be out of the question. Another possible hallucinogen occurred in rye bread, a staple of the European peasant's diet in the Middle Ages. When winters were extremely cold, a fungus called ergot infected the rye. The bread could induce LSD-type hallucinations, such as seeing a werewolf or being one. Suddenly, a perfectly normal person became wild, mad, bestial, whatever. It affects the brain. People go quite nuts. They run around and, and you know, act crazy. And there have been, there have been murders, berserk situations uh, that have been attributed to people eating this poison. Reports of villagers frightened by the sight of a ragged human running through the forest fueled fears of werewolves. But the culprit was often just a hermit. And there were a few cases of feral or wild children who, after being lost or abandoned, had learned forest survival skills. Amala and Kamala were among 16 children supposedly raised by wolves who were found in India between 1843 and 1933. When the girls were removed from a wolf lair in 1920, they walked on all fours, ate nothing but raw meat, and howled to escape captivity. Amala died within one year at the age of about two and a half. Kamala died nine years later at age 17. Perhaps the most famous feral child was Victor of Aviron, whose story was told in the 1969 Francois Truffaut film, The Wild Child. In 1797, French villagers became frightened by a mysterious wild man seen running through the woods. Three years later, a naked 12-year-old boy was captured. 
He was covered with cuts and bruises and terrified of humans. And he preferred to eat nuts and berries to any prepared food. Victor lived to the age of 40, but never learned to speak. Another explanation for werewolf sightings could be two medical diseases discovered later. One, hypertrichosis, is a rare genetic disorder that occurs in one in every billion births. It causes increased hair growth all over the body. And this can be very extensive, so extensive uh, that it vir virtually covers the skin surface and uh, makes the child look like a, a dog or animal uh, or a werewolf. In the 16th century, this disease was observed in Peter Gonzalez and his children. There are these wonderful drawings of the, 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 the people with these furry faces, looking, by the way, very much like Lon, the Lon Chaney Jr. makeup. During the Middle Ages, such people could have easily been mistaken for werewolves. Seeing these pictures would, say, would lead people to believe, oh my, yes, yeah, goodness, yes, it's all true. The second disease that may have helped perpetuate the werewolf myth is porphyria. It's an extremely rare form of a genetic blood disorder first recognized early in the 20th century. In some severe cases, patients are so sensitive to sunlight that prolonged exposure could result in the loss of tissue from the extremities, face, and head. Somebody like this might tend to come out late at night if they had a lot of damage to their tissues, their hands particularly, their hands might be sort of, uh, tend to hold their hands in a clawed up position. If the tissue was lost from their lips, their teeth would be more exposed. Uh, and there would be this brownish color which people might associate with blood. Uh, plus this slight amount of extra hair growth, particularly around the temples. Some experts dispute the scientific and medical data saying they are insufficient explanations for the broad-based, pervasive belief in werewolves during the 16th and 17th centuries. Werewolf beliefs are not just in a few places where uh, LSD might have gotten into the food supply. Uh, werewolves are not just in a few places where there might have been outbreaks or family traditions of porphyria. Um, it's a much larger phenomena than that. The werewolf mythos uh, has come down to us through the ages, uh, basically as a myth about our inner nature. Uh, the animal side of us, as we like to think about it, as opposed to the spiritual side, it has a certain amount of appeal because we are animals, after all. I think it's a mistake to go look for uh, rational explanations because on some level it's not. People have always been fascinated with the, uh, the blurred boundary you know, between human beings and animals, especially of um, uh, the fear of the beast within. When In Search of History returns, Hollywood creates the ultimate werewolf saga. Despite a lineage that dates back to ancient times, most of what is familiar today about werewolves comes from the 1941 movie, The Wolfman. Whoever is bitten by a werewolf and lives becomes a werewolf himself. Starring Lon Chaney Jr. as the werewolf, the monster is instantly recognizable. Universal's The Wolfman was the premier horror icon of, of the 1940s. It was the, uh, uh, the first really original, you know, monster that had come down the pike for a long time. The Wolfman is a great, great film. What the werewolf lacks is a great novel. And that's perhaps why the werewolf is not quite as, as popular as the vampire or, 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 or the Frankenstein monster or Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. There are a lot of very fine werewolf stories but no, there's nothing to match Dracula, nothing to match, the, you know, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Typical of the literary attempts was an 1846 Victorian potboiler by G.W.M. Reynolds, Wagner the Werewolf. It was serialized a chapter at a time in the pulp magazines of the day that were known as Penny Dreadfuls. It's sort of 
rolling Victorian prose, the werewolf snatching off the golden-haired, violet-eyed child, the mother screaming, and all of this kind of stuff, which, which was meant to, meant to thrill the, the working men and shop girls of 19th century England. Nearly 20 years later, in 1865, a more scholarly work appeared, a collection of legends assembled by the cleric Sabine Baring Gould in The Book of Werewolves. But the first novel to gain literary recognition would not be published until 1933. Written by Hollywood screenwriter Guy Endor and set in France, it was called The Werewolf of Paris. This was actually based upon a real case of a <clears throat> French soldier who had gotten into the uh, cemeteries of uh, Paris and was actually ghoul-like, eating the blood and gore of, re of the recently dead. Uh, but this story traced him as if he were a werewolf. And uh, then in 1935, it was uh, turned into a, a movie that was quite successful. The movie, renamed The Werewolf of London, swapped Paris for London to appeal to its English-speaking audience. When my experiments are completed, I will show their results to the entire world, not before. Remember this, Dr. Glendon. The werewolf instinctively seeks to kill the thing it loves best. It was the first feature-length werewolf film, and though well-received, the film failed to become the benchmark for the genre. The reason? The censors. Censors felt the transformation from man into beast was too close a parallel to Darwin's controversial theory of evolution. Especially coming hot on the heels of the infamous Scopes monkey trial. A fiercely debated case in which a Tennessee school teacher was prosecuted for presenting evolution to his class. Thus, the crucial scene of any werewolf movie, the transformation, happened off screen. With the film's box office success, Universal Studios was eager to produce another. But again, they ran into censorship. As Adolf Hitler was tightening his Nazi noose around Europe, censors decided that horror movies had no place in the tension-ridden times. Just before World War II, there was an international embargo on Hollywood horror movies, and they uh, stopped making them for a few years because the British Board of Film Censors was very concerned that this was a demoralizing kind of form of, of entertainment. Curiously, Hitler was fascinated with wolves. Typical was the term he chose for his dreaded U-boats, the Wolf Pack, so called for their tactic of surrounding a convoy and mercilessly picking off one ship at a time. Adolf Hitler was absolutely fascinated with wolf imagery. He surrounded himself with all kinds of uh, totems and, and liked to uh, name things after wolves. And uh, one of his favorite American uh, motion pictures was uh, uh, The Three Little Pigs. And uh, he used to whistle, who's afraid of the big bad wolf, you know, as he uh, went about his bunker. The ban on horror movies, however, would itself become a war casualty. It turned out that moviegoers needed an emotional release. And horror movies fit the bill. In the Wolfman movies, starring Lon Chaney, that Universal Pictures made, is an American character who's kind of displaced into a 1940s um, Europe where there is no war but there's a werewolf behind every tree. And what you have in the Wolfman saga is the werewolf trying to put to sleep the beast in human nature. All of this, you know, happening against the real world backdrop of, of the war. And it's probably not a coincidence that the, uh, the, the Wolfman saga uh, began right after Pearl Harbor and uh, wound up just in time for Hiroshima. The Wolfman established the defining traits of a werewolf, his appearance when the moon was full, the mark of the pentagram, a satanic emblem that pointed to the werewolf's next victim, and death by a silver bullet, 
silver purportedly being to werewolves as garlic is to vampires. But the most memorable was the transformation from man to wolf, the first time audiences had ever seen this on screen. The overwhelming power of the visual would change the public's perception of the monster for all time. One of the things that, that both stage and screen do to uh, complex folk mythology is they simplify it and put it together so that you can uh, have it easily available to you. Movies helped us in understanding the werewolf by simplifying it and, and giving it some characteristics we could identify with. The werewolf's movie characteristics were created by German emigrant and screenwriter Kurt Siodmak. I've got to give credit to Kurt Siodmak, who I think is the father of all modern werewolf myths, the full moon, the silver bullet, a uh, pentagram in the hand. As far as I know, Kurt Siodmak invented all that. And I look with the eye of a camera when I write for motion pictures. So I invented certain things like the pentagram. Maybe it exists before, I don't know. Siodmak also invented a few lines of verse that chilled the spines of millions of viewers and became a classic quote of the genre. Even a man who is pure in heart and says his prayers at night we become a wolf, and the wolf bane blooms, and the autumn moon is bright. The result of Siodmak's brilliantly conceived screenplay was that Hollywood had simply made up its own rules about the werewolf, rules that stuck. Everybody believes that the real way to become a werewolf is you'll be bitten by a werewolf. That comes right out of the films. No. That's, that's strictly Hollywood law. When a werewolf, a werewolf didn't bite people, a werewolf tore them to bits and ate them. There wasn't gonna be enough left of the victim to become another werewolf. But it was that film that for modern America, I think for probably the modern world, has fixed the image of the werewolf as this flat-faced, furry thing with fangs. But that is, that's, that's the Hollywood werewolf. It, it's not the werewolf of ancient legend. When In Search of History continues, the werewolf legend still has the power to fascinate. Despite all that's known about werewolves, from ancient legends and myths to scientific and medical explanations, the animal continues to instill intense debate. Conservationist groups fight for the right of the wolf to exist, believing he symbolizes all that is wild and free in nature. Others would prefer wolves be eradicated completely, seeing them as dangerous and destructive predators. Humans' uneasy relationship with the wolf continues. Man has a beast inside him, and there's, a ch there's this sort of secret desire to change into one and, and lose all the civilized restraints. The more civilized we, we are, the more we need, to, um, we need to at least fantasize about no longer being civilized. Such fantasies became widespread when the old werewolf films were released on television in the 1950s. Children began to develop an affinity with the scary creature. It wasn't until the, the films were released to television and, and, and were really available to the public to see, and the kids started getting their hands on them, they adopted them. Because at 12 years old, monsters, you latch on to that uh, because they're not understood any more than you are. They have a tough time dealing with their environments, just like you do. But they can fight back, and you, you fantasize through those characters. <laughs> Rather than an object of fear, the werewolf was becoming a pop culture icon. In 1972, Marvel Comics legend Stan Lee created a series, Werewolf by Night. They're fun to read about. You know, even little kids, um, they're always looking under the bed, hoping there isn't a monster under the bed or an ogre. And uh, there is something fascinating about the idea that maybe Maybe in some way, some people do change at night into something else. 
Contemporary adults have been reticent to abandon the werewolf as mere kid stuff. Gary Brander's best-selling 1977 novel, The Howling, about a contemporary coven of werewolves, became a cult classic in part by focusing on the werewolf's raw sexuality and lust. The face of the wolf was only an inch from his own. Its breath hot and damp hissed in his ear. The glistening teeth, as long as two of his finger joints, snapped at the air and moved closer to his throat. Part of the joy of being a werewolf is that you can go out and <laughs> jump any lady werewolf you want to, and uh, no one's going to uh, look funny at you. Or it's, it's the freedom, the freedom to be as sexy and lustful as you want to. Modern werewolves even stalk the internet. A live action role playing game, Werewolf the Apocalypse, is so popular that it attracts thousands of players around the world. We use the internet to link up a whole bunch of uh, games across the United States and actually across the uh, different nations and where we communicate to each other about what's happening in, in each of our games. And so we create this shared universe of many little games making a larger game. You lose. The werewolf of this kind of a group is not your ravening, child-killing beast. They're new age werewolves. They're really representative of a lot of good things in the world. Thank you. In 1997, the United States Post Office joined the monster craze with five movie monster stamps. Lon Chaney Jr.'s Wolfman is back in vogue more than 50 years after writer Kurt Siodmak created the character. So I created something which might live much longer. It only shows you shouldn't be a writer, should be a poster stamp. Then you're immortal. The werewolf has evolved throughout history. What most of us now accept as legend was once very real. It began as a way to explain the unexplainable, a creature to blame for the atrocities of man, and a symbol of the sexuality and power that many humans envied but could not attain. The werewolf holds a prominent place in our past and continues to live on, primarily for our entertainment as we discover when we go in search of history.